Hey, tailgaters! Ross of the Pigskin Tales Podcast here. Feel that summer heat? It's not just the sun, it's the thrill of upcoming college football season, stoking the coals. So get ready for the season, dive into the history books with Homefield, the premium collegiate apparel brand from Indianapolis. Homefield crafts incredibly comfortable gear designed with iconic vintage nods over 150 colleges. A library of history right on your chest. Homefield is the Indiana Jones of collegiate apparel, uncovering hidden gems from school archives. Unique mascots, logos, and even unforgettable moments frozen in time. Visit homefieldapparel.com and shop the archives. Homefield Apparel, where comfort, nostalgia, and the spirit of college football history unite. Again, that's homefieldapparel.com. Author Timothy P. Brown joins us in today's episode to talk about an interesting look at who provided the first fake field goal. Could it be Fielding Yost of Michigan? It could be with the great innovation he has. We have more from Timothy P. Brown, football archaeology, coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. Darren Hayes, pigskindispatch.com. It is Tuesday, and once again, we are going to visit with Timothy P. Brown of footballarchaeology.com. Uh, Tim, welcome back to the pig pen. Hey, Darren. Thank you. Look forward to, to chatting again. I uh, think we got a good one to, to cover this evening. Yeah, this is uh, this one I is a subject that I know a little bit about. I, I've talked to an author that's uh, wrote quite a bit about uh, this famous coach, uh, Fielding Yost of Michigan. This is probably his most famous uh, stance or most famous position. That's where the school he's most associated with. Let me try to get that out of my mouth. Uh, but uh, you you have a very interesting story on him that uh, sort of takes back uh, through his whole career and uh, sort of settles a dispute uh, by digging through the old newspapers and everything. And it's a really interesting, great job of work on your part. And I will let you take it from here, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is one that, um, you know, you're kind of digging, digging around for playing detective, looking, reading old newspapers, and all of a sudden you find something that, you know, I wasn't expecting, you know, quite the ending to the story. But, um, but you know, so, I mean, this is one of these ideas or issues where, you know, everybody talks about football is uh, is always, there's nothing new, right? There's nothing new in football. Everything gets recycled. Everything gets adapted. Um, and, you know, that's, at some level, you know, reasonably true. You know, there are certain, you know, true innov- in, true innovations, and one of those is embedded here. But it's also a bunch of these, you know, people copying ideas <laughs> over and over again. But it's kind of part of the funny thing about this story is that um, here's an instance where things got copied, and this sports writer didn't know that. He Apparently, it was the first time he saw this occur in a game. But so, you know, what it was is that um, I came across an article from a 1913 game when Michigan played Penn. And during the game, Michigan attempted a fake field goal. And this writer just was, you know, wrote a, a follow up after the game just about this fake field goal attempt and praising Fielding Yost, talking about what a great innovator he is and blah, blah, blah. And um, so, you know, so I started. When I came across that, I was like, is that possibly the first time somebody ran a fake field goal? You know, I would have thought even just by, you know, um, due to a bad snap or whatever, somebody would have um, right w- would have tried one, right? And then maybe said, oh, geez, this works pretty well. I'm going to do this again. Um, so what happened was that, you know, Michigan, um, so I'm, I'm going to back up just a little bit and say until 1886, every field goal attempt was a drop kick. There were no, there was no snap from the center to a holder who held the ball for the kicker. Um, it took, 
you know, some human beings to figure out to do that. And it you know, turned out it was these two brothers who played at Otterbein in Ohio, in a small school there. So, you know, they figured out, hey, we could snap the ball, have a guy hold it, and the kicker could kick it. And then we, you know, we've got a better chance, you know, especially under the right weather conditions, a place kick typically had more power and was more accurate than a drop kick because the ball didn't bounce true off the, you know, uneven turf and, and grass at the time. So um, here, we, you know, we move ahead then to 1913 and this Penn Michigan game. And so, the, you know, Michigan sets up for a regular field goal attempt and they snap the ball. Um, but instead of the holder putting the ball down on the ground, the kicker, you know, moved forward, swung his leg, leg forward, just like normal, but the holder stood up and then went sprinting around the left end and he scored a touchdown, you know, rather than the, the, the field goal attempt. And so, you know, part of what's funny about that is that the writer was saying, oh, you know, just this tremendous, you know, the execution on this play was, was incredible. Well, then in fact, the, the play got called back due to holding. So <laughs> the execution wasn't that great. Um, but, you know, so then it was like, okay, so here was a fake field goal, you know, obviously a planned fake field goal. And so I started looking around, okay, when did these things first occur? And so, like I said earlier, 1886 was the first time that any team uh, snapped to a holder and then executed a, uh, a, a placement kick. And so the first fake field goal that I could find, and this is just through searching newspaper articles, was a 19 or 1897 uh, game between Kansas and Iowa when Kansas faked uh, a field goal. Um, then the next year, there was the second one I find is 1898 when Nebraska runs a fake field goal against Kansas. So the guys who, you know, did it as far as I can tell, invented it, um, have it executed against them the following year. And then the key thing about that, or the interesting thing about that, is that the the coach of Nebraska in 1898 is Fielding Yost, you know, <laughs> a coach at, at Michigan who this writer was just, you know, effusive with praise about. So, um, so anyways, then, you know, doing additional searching and everything, you know, there were there are fake field goals all over the place. You know, I'm not saying there were, you know, thousands a year or anything like that, but, you know, most years, once it, once the placement kick from scrimmage got started, you know, people were also executing the fake field goals. So, um, unfortunately, this, the, the writer, it was an anonymous column, so I could never, couldn't figure out who the writer was that came up with this because otherwise I would have tried to reach their, his relatives and tell them that they're, their grandpa was lacking <laughs> in, in his football history uh, skills. <laughs> okay. So, so the, so Kansas did it first and then yeah. they had it done against them the following year by Nebraska. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Cause and fielding that, Yost was the coach at, at, Nebraska. at Nebraska. And then he was coach again at Michigan when they did this in 1913. Well, I, I was trying to think about it cause I know from a, a previous author I had on the, 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 the biography on Yost. I know he was at Kansas too, but he, I'm looking right now. He was at Nebraska uh, 1898. He was at Kansas 1899. So it was reverse where I was sitting there thinking he, he might've been yeah. a coach for both of those games, but the head coach that did it, but he was Kansas on the other side of the. And then he ended up at, he was at uh, Stanford, right? In 1900. Yeah, yeah. Stanford. And then, you know, the end of the season, San Jose state, he did oh, okay. like a championship game and then, then went to Michigan, but yeah, pretty pretty well-traveled coach. Uh, yeah. For a little bit there. And he was Plus Ohio he was, Wesleyan uh, before all of that too. So, <laughs> and he was a ringer when he played in college too. Yeah. He, yes. he went to West Virginia, but he played for Lafayette in the big game that where they took down Penn and snapped their win streak, whatever it was, 2018. Yeah, Park, Park H Davis, the yeah. famous historian was the coach of Lafayette. So yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of historic ties there with it. <laughs> Which is why he names that team the national champs. <laughs> yeah. He, he named a lot of odd ones, national champs. Yeah. <laughs> you back and scratch your head a few times. Yeah. That, that's really, really cool story. I love how that uh, you know, sort of circles back around to him, yeah. you know, 
And uh, what was there, 20, almost 20 years in between, uh, 15 years in between yeah. Uh, yeah. the plays. But uh, I guess uh, the credit is due to him in some respects. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, yeah, hey, you out. know, he picked up something, he saw something he liked and executed it. And yeah, plus I think there was a, um, I don't have my note here, here on it, but I'm almost positive Michigan ran a fake field goal too before the 1913 game. So under, under Yost. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, that it brings back that fake field goal. And I, I'm sure it wasn't a rule at the time. I'm sure it was a rule put in afterwards, but there, there was a rule in high school. And I think it was at the collegiate level too, that if somebody, you know, how a, a holder was usually down on a knee to take the snap. Yeah. That's the only exception where you can have a live ball with a person with their knee on the ground. Yeah. So with that exception, they have to hold for a kick or an attempted kick. So if that holder is on a knee, takes that snap and stands up and throws a pass or runs, it's a dead ball because he was a runner with his knee on the ground with a live ball. So I'm sure, like I said, it probably wasn't back in that era. They probably put it in. So we had a, a game, a high school game, where a very clever coach told us before the game, you know, usually they want to make sure so we don't kill their, their you know, brainstorm idea that they had all overnight or something. This guy would get down in a catcher's position. So both knees off the ground, he's just in a squat, and the defense, you know, is probably not paying attention to what he's doing. But he would catch the ball. The kicker would come up similar to what you're saying, fake a kick. This kid would, with the holder would pound the ball with his hand. So it sounded like there was foot hitting ball and then take off. And I think he was going to throw a pass is what his intent was. So, uh, you know, just some clever things that they do out of these, these fake field goals, but that, that knee on the ground exceptions. Well, you know, <clears throat> back then, both in the 1898 and the 1913 example, having a knee on the ground wasn't yet a rule that made the ball dead. Right. I mean, that great you, could still, you could be tackled and still get up and run. You know, you had to be held to the ground still. Um, but yeah, you know, the, 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 the catcher squat that you mentioned, that was actually some of the early field goal teams did that. Uh, I mean, those, those executing a placement kick, they did that instead of, of uh, going to the knee. And part of that was because that was still in the time when they, when a lot of teams still were rolling ball sideways back from the center to the quarterback. Right. And so they, the quarterback, if he was on one knee, he couldn't, you know, the ball would bounce crazily. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the squat helped them just, uh, you know, catch the ball properly or, or at least be able to reach the ball. And I've even, I've got a picture of, Arizona, and I want to say it was like 1938 or 1936, something like that, where their their holder is in that kind of uh, squat position. So people continued doing that for, you know, for some time. And probably, you know, they may have just been in a situation where, you know, who knows, it might have had a substitute center or somebody who just wasn't a very, very effective long snapper. And so you know. he was substitute center. He's also starting catcher on the baseball team in the yeah. fall, <laughs> spring. <laughs> well, yeah, so. yeah, great stuff. That's uh, very fascinating. Just like uh, every evening you, you have these great little pieces and nuggets of uh, information of football history that uh, you don't hear mainstream and you don't see in you know, every football history book you, you read. And, you know, just like tonight you took, it took some digging for you to do that. I'm sure. You know, it took a, a few hours of research going through yeah. the old newspapers. Uh, I, I can uh, feel your pain on that sometimes, but it's fun. Yeah, the problem is, that, you know, half the time I'm doing these things while I'm watching some football games, so I don't even watch half the game. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> yeah, you know, how, looking how, online. Where'd those 30 points come from? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, good stuff as always. Uh, why will not you uh, share with the listeners where they too can uh, enjoy your tidbits each and every night? Yeah, so... You know, my website is footballarchaeology.com, so you can go on there. You you know, every post allows you to subscribe, uh, which then means you will get a get an email every night, uh, you know, into into your inbox with, with the story. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Football Archaeology. And uh, so whichever one works for you, um, whichever way you prefer to consume information, have at it. Or, hey, you can do both. So... Either way, and, yeah, I do, and you get double the pleasure. You get the, the read, <laughs> read the the Twitter and the email. So uh, good stuff as always, uh, Tim. We appreciate uh, you sharing this with us and this uh, the great research that you do at footballarchaeology.com and your daily tidbits. And uh, 
you know, your great writings that you do. And we thank you very much for sharing with us each and every week. And we hope to talk to you again next Tuesday. Very good. Always enjoy it. And glad to, glad to spread the word with you on football history stuff. Peeking up at the clock, the time's running down. We're going to go into victory formation, take a knee, and let this baby run out. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for the next podcast. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.